For more than 30 years, Gerald Douglas Hines has achieved phenomenal success in real estate development. He's been called a genius, a visionary, and a modern Medici. Today, we'd like to give you the opportunity to meet the man who is the founder of Heinz Interests Limited Partnership and hear from him how it all happened. First thing that uh, struck me as I walked into this office is that this is not the typical developer's office, is it? Well, I think basically this is a, is a cockpit, so to speak. It's uh, no bigger than anyone else's office. Uh, effectively 10 feet wide and uh, uh, is where I can be, but uh, to receive guests I have the, um, you might say, the conference room in the other area, which gives me a clean desk policy. And developers have a very hard time keeping a clean desk policy, so uh, by just keeping all your material in the cockpit, you do have a clean desk policy, so that's, uh, and also it, it gives me privacy when I need it. Uh, you had achieved your success uh, quite a few years ago without any of the flamboyance that we associate with certain other people in the, in the developing profession. Uh, had it ever occurred to you that, that uh, you should be any other way, or had you always intended to be as, as, uh, as low profile as you've been? Well, I think you, you are what you are and uh, your personality and uh, you don't change uh, your style from a premeditated point of view. So I think you, that expresses the way you're, you really want to express yourself and uh, so I think that's a, uh, it's just an, an expression of the inner person. You seem to have done a better job than most at combining the the artistic with the practical, the the architect with the engineer, who traditionally are considered almost uh, oh friendly enemies. Each one claims the other is thwarting is thwarting his efforts to to achieve what he wants to do. How were you able to bring those two together as successfully as you were? Well, I guess I start out as an as a person that's educated as an engineer. But I've also appreciated architecture because I think it is the way our cities are built and we create an environment that we're going to live in for a long time. And I think that the quality of our cities is very, has been very important to our firm. And let's say one of the first jobs I got involved with uh, Mr. Rolfe, who had been the Dean of Architecture at the University of Texas, talked to me a lot about architecture, the responsibility of building, and those type of things, which made a lasting impression, impression on me. And I think that uh, I've been very interested in the development of the city and what makes the city, how quality adds additional quality to a city and I think that has been something that has been interesting for us and it became a, a hallmark that we could differentiate ourselves from other developers. That became a pretty good marketing tool and people sought us out because they knew if we did it it would be a quality piece of work and their reputation would be enhanced. So we use that as a part of our long-term company philosophy, so to speak. You had been building, prior to the Shell project, the One Shell Plaza, you had been building quite a bit and had, had made your mark certainly in Houston. And yet that was such a huge leap from what you had done before. How did that come about? Why the decision to, to make that kind of a a large jump in what you had done. Well, I think we uh, we had an opportunity to build what was could have been one of the significant buildings in the country, and I think with Skidmore Owens and Merrill Bruce Graham, uh, we achieved a building that was unusual, 
It was unusual in its structure. It was the tallest lightweight concrete building in the world at the time. And it, it had a classic type of architecture, which to this day stands as a great building, even though it was designed 25 years ago. You have great respect for, for architectural talent, and you're known for hiring the best architects in the country, if not in the world. And yet, you're also known for butting heads with them. And I'm, I'm personally curious how you you really fight for for what you believe is right, even when you are working with a world-renowned architect. Can you explain how that process works? Let's just say the the architect is the pitcher, and he throws the the balls over the plate, and we either swing at them or we let them pass, and it may be a ball. So. Sometimes, such as Post Oak Central, we had five different plans that Philip Johnson drew before we were satisfied with one that made sense to us in this marketplace. First place, architects are not, do not have to lease the building. They don't have to live in it. We have to live with the building for 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years. So consequently, functionally, we know how to make a building functional, and if the building doesn't meet that criteria, then we start over again. And, uh, or that something that we feel will fit the market in the area that we are marketing that building, we have to have something that fits that particular culture. And in Minneapolis, we were very successful in just completing Norwest, which we really did hit right down the middle of where the Minneapolis wanted to be. It had a character that recalled their old history, and it, be, it has become a symbol of the city. And that's when we know that we've been successful when our buildings become the symbol of the city. Do you take a great deal of personal pleasure in, the, in these buildings? Do you, do you see them as uh, something you are personally proud of having done? Oh, certainly. That. I mean, that's part of the fun of, of building while I'm in this business is you get a personal uh, pleasure out of seeing the work you've done. You get a personal gratification. And it's, it's not just a piece of paper that you're producing. You're producing a physical structure, but you see a physical r reminder of your work. And I think that, that all people that, that work in this field have that distinct pleasure because it's a physical exemplification of their work. There's very little that, that people know uh, popularly about your early life. And I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about what, your, what was your early life like? What was your childhood like uh, back home in Indiana? Oh, I was uh, a normal, a normal uh, boy growing up in, in Gary, Indiana, and uh, grew up during the Depression. So it was, uh, you, didn't, you didn't get everything from your father and mother that you'd like. But I remember I wanted a bicycle. My father told me, well, he wouldn't give me one, but he'd show me how to earn one. And that was, got me a magazine route, and then I got a paper route, and then I went to work for Sears and uh, selling shoes, and uh, went to work in the steel mill. I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to work in a steel mill. <laughs> So that's very important. You have to learn what you don't want to do in life. And uh, um, then went on to Purdue University before I finished high school and got a year, a year in before I was 18 and went in the Army in World War II. And uh, then came back after the service and uh, uh, finished up uh, for two years and got an, had an opportunity after I went with a major company to decide between Baltimore, Indianapolis, and Houston. And I had about four fraternity brothers down here and I decided to come to Houston. And that was how I got here 
and the Shamrock Hotel opened up in uh, about two months after I got here, and I was impressed with uh, with such a extravaganza. But uh, so I'd never been to Texas before, but it was interesting, and I think they I was impressed that they didn't ask you how long your father had been here, but what you could do and. Um, and that set this part of the country apart, didn't it? I, I think so. I think it uh, gave each young man that came down here an opportunity. And a lot of great people came down here at that time. Our president came down here about that time, George Bush, and he also had a good start. And the Litkeys and all, just a whole Ben Love, and we all came down here after the war. and. Uh, Houston gave us a start, and uh, it, it judged us on what we did and how we performed it. And uh, I remember the first note I signed was uh, not a real estate note and a deed of trust on the, the land, but just a personal note. That's all Judge Elkins wanted. Uh, he just wanted to know he had the individual. That's all, and he, he never made a real estate loan for probably the first three or four years of my real estate career. So, Have you always had the entrepreneurial streak in you? Do you remember as a child, for instance, what, what kind of jobs did you have? Oh, the very first job I can remember, I guess, was um, collecting papers and selling them at the junkyard. And uh, so going around to the neighbors and picking up their excess papers and then selling them at the junkyard. And then uh, I guess the magazine route and then the, and then the paper route. And I learned about collections. I learned that you'd better be there when they got that paycheck on Friday night because then you might have to carry them for another two weeks, and it was 18 cents a week. So it was 36 cents by the time you got to the two weeks, and if you had to carry them another two weeks, that meant, that meant 72 cents that you were in the, so your accounts receivable, I learned about accounts receivable very early then. And uh, selling shoes was a very humbling experience, especially with the workers with their, uh, but when you got a, a worker with that came in for work shoes, that was a 50% extra charge. And so that was a big sale. So no matter how, how bad his feet smelled, you, you made that sale. So those are a couple of things that, uh, that were interesting. And I think that uh, working in the steel mill, I said uh, earlier, where you learned what you didn't want to do, what you don't want to do in life, and I think that was uh, I didn't want to work in a big in a big factory. Uh, Carl Hooper wrote in an article that uh, that part of your success may have been attributed to the fact that you have an honest face. Did, have you ever been aware of that, or do you feel that's true? I'm not sure <laughs> that that's. Uh, but I'll attribute that to my good, my uh, wonderful mother, who, uh, if I do have an honest face, and uh, who is going to be here next Thursday. And she's 98 years of age, and and so I look forward to uh, having some fun with her while she's down here. Well, you talked about when when she was raising you, and and uh, you had the the jobs. You learned to earn what you wanted. You learned to work for what you had. Do you believe it all in luck? Do you think luck had a hand in anything that you've done? Oh, I think. There's a little luck along the way, and uh, I think you make your own luck. And I think that each job that you do is a foundation for the next job up. Someone says, did you look up the ladder? No, no, you only look up the next rung on that ladder and then try to do a good job on what you did to prepare yourself for that next rung. And I think that's the way in every business career. and then as you get to that next plateau, there's opportunities come from what you've done before. 
and it's always done on the basis of what you've, the foundation you've laid. Along the way, do you recall ever getting a sense that you were in any way exceptional, that you had unusual abilities or skills or, or something that might give you a, an advantage? No, no. I always fought for everything that uh, uh, I think we've been fortunate to have very outstanding people in our firm and I think that uh, I would attribute the success of our firm to the, the quality of people and the longevity that we've had of those people in, in working for the firm and I think that, that those are the aspects that have really made our firm and uh, will continue to make it. How do you I guess the question would be, how do you feel about your the day-to-day -day operation that you have uh, with this company? Oh, I think it's... Uh, we have a, a very close feeling to the people that are involved. Uh, obviously, uh, in a firm that uh, my son is, is now president of the firm, uh, it's it's something that we've enjoyed building and we look forward we're going to be going through some some uh, tougher times in the next uh, three to five years and uh, but we've gone through tough times before and so we'll go through these again but I think that I look definitely forward to the changing business, and as we open an office in Berlin the 1st of March, that's a whole new aspect of our life and of our business life to do business in a, in a foreign country such as Germany and Europe, and it's exciting, and I think that uh, the United States is going to come back. We're going to buy existing property. We have financial connections that other people don't have. So the one thing about our business, if you think you're bored today, just sit still because tomorrow is going to be different and there'll be new problems to solve and new, new challenges. And that's what's interesting. It's not the same. Can we talk a little bit about uh, your activities outside of work. You, as a matter of fact, I understand, uh, are quite an avid cyclist. You uh, ride your bicycle each day? Well, not each day, but I do ride it uh, quite a bit in the winter, maybe a couple times to maybe three times uh, during the winter. But in the summer, uh, June, July, and August, I try to ride every day. And that's in, in uh, wherever I am, and uh, that could be London, could be France, could be Aspen, and uh, or Houston, but uh, I think that's, there's beautiful scenery in Colorado, and I've enjoyed riding in that, in that area. How about mountain climbing? Well, I've done some of that, uh, not as much lately as I used to, and uh, although I did climb in the Tetons two years ago with a group of people from the firm and uh, that's kind of fun and uh, but mainly trekking has been our the thing that I did two years ago which was Rondonet is uh, walking on skis with skins with mountain guides and uh, that was uh, a very nice trip that we took. We were going to do the uh, oat route, but it was, uh, we got seven feet of snow and uh, they evacuated the huts and uh, so we climbed about five different mountains and uh, that was very enjoyable. And you also uh, are a windsurfer, did I understand correctly? I, w I wouldn't call myself a windsurfer. I'd say that uh, you have been I've known attempted, to windsurf. I have attempted it, uh, <laughs> and that takes a long time to uh, get to be a good windsurfer. All of which brings up the obvious question: 
where do you get your energy to do the things you do? Uh, I, I was astonished in the research I did for this, what you're able to pack into a week. When you enjoy doing certain things, you, uh, you do them. And I think that uh, I've enjoyed skiing and I've enjoyed tennis and those things are, I much rather do those than work out on, on stationary bikes or uh, treadmills and things like that. So I've enjoyed that. That's been a, a part of uh, staying in shape and I think that, uh, that if you're in shape physically, then you're mentally in shape too. And I think that it helps uh, carry the, the pressures that are always, always there in a business, any business. And I think that uh, we've advocated that that's a pretty good idea to stay in shape. And it's You've always been someone who's responded to, to personal challenges, and you don't seem to be showing any signs of letting up. And yet, as we as we change, as we as we go through life, different things take on importance. What's important to you today? Well, I think some of the same things: my family, um, the people in the business, um, and that we maintain our reputation for quality with the tenants and our investors. Uh, those relationships have been built over many, many years and we don't intend that those relationships be deterred. What characteristics do you look for in your, in your most valued employees? Well, I think we look for, for people that are, have outstanding in their particular area of expertise, have re achieved a certain level of professionalism, have integrity, have ability to communicate uh, those ideas and work with other people. How much does salesmanship have to do with the things that you've done? Uh, some articles about you say that you, you show a lot of salesmanship. Are, is that deliberate? Do you feel like you're selling something when you go in to convince someone to, to, to become a tenant or to go into a partnership? Well, I think you have to express the, I'm not sure we call it, if, if you're laying out the things that, that differentiate you from your competitor, then I think that is uh, uh, some level of salesmanship. But if it's all valid, then you're just laying out the facts, and that's what you want your customer to make a decision on, are the facts. And uh, so we try to, to have enough specifics that are valid that make people reflect in their decision making to occupy our buildings and if we've been good at putting those things in our buildings we'll get uh, our fair share of the tenants. What should new employees know about this company? Well that we've tried to perform a service to our our tenants every day that we start the day out is a day to earn our right to renew that lease and service to our clients, which are our tenants, is our most important aspect. We are in the service business and we, we better not ever forget that. You don't seem to have lost your enthusiasm for the business after all this time. Oh, I don't think so. No, there's always a, there's always something new and there's always something changing and I think that's what has turned us on and uh, made it interesting for us. Because it does change every, uh, whether it's finance or uh, the financial markets are changing, the investors are changing, the tenants are changing, and the acquisition of land and the governmental authorities are changing. So you're always interacting against a whole changing set of characters because our society is not static, and that's what makes it fun. What other thoughts would you have for 
for new employees, uh, bright-eyed, sharp employees who are coming on board and hoping to make their mark? Well, I'd say that uh, it's important that we execute in a very professional way whatever job you have, because we get judged by the professionalism that we execute in all aspects, whether it be accounting, bookkeeping, property management, marketing. Uh, we want to be professional. And the highest level of professionalism that we can reach is, is what will achieve the best for the individual and for us.